couple of questions here. Let's see. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, Reverend Curry, do you believe that parts of your soul can become captive by the devil in his realm? And if so, does it take someone highly trained and able to see in the spirit to set the person free? I do believe people can lose their soul and can be captivated by the devil. Uh, it doesn't take someone highly trained and you don't have to see in the spirit to get them free, right? All you have to do is know your authority in Jesus Christ and you can set them free, amen? Now, now if you have a gift and you can see in the spirit, wonderful, all right? I'm not against gifts. I'm just saying don't think you can't do it if you don't have a gift because you have the gift of the Holy Ghost who does it all anyway, amen? amen. Okay, now, <clears throat> you have to realize the apostles that Jesus tro uh, chose were highly uneducated, were highly unequipped, and had no spiritual gifting that you can <laughs> determine from Scripture. He took people that were not, uh, wouldn't have been chosen by anybody else, and used them, and trained them, and gave them authority to do what they did, and they did it with his authority, and they were not specially gifted or anything else, okay? Matter of fact, I'll even throw one better at you. They weren't even born again, okay, at that point. Hadn't even received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. They, they did everything they did just by authority, right? So all that stuff you think you have to have before you can do it, that, that, <laughs> that's not Bible, okay? Main thing you need is a heart to help people. Right? Not a religious heart that wants to stick to traditions and rules and regulations, but a heart to help people. Okay? So, now, uh, dear Curry, I notice there is no prayer at the start or end of your teaching. Is there any reason for this? <laughs> okay. Actually, well, there's more. Okay. Also, no worship. What is your opinion on the importance of praise and worship and healing? Okay. Okay, you asked me. Okay. <laughs> so, I didn't just bring this up. You asked me. Okay. <clears throat> First off, uh, prayer sometimes yes, sometimes no at the beginning and end. All right? Just, I mean, we can, we don't. I mean, if you notice, I was praying for people all last night and in between. I'm not talking about, I know that's not the kind of prayer you're talking about. You're talking about an opening prayer and an ending prayer. Okay. Um, <clears throat> to be very honest with you, I, I, we can do that, and sometimes I do, and sometimes I don't, and if I do, great, and if I don't, it doesn't bother me or God, okay? Now, as far as prayer life, it's kind of strange because I don't spend hours on my knees in prayer. However, <clears throat> I never end prayer. I pray without ceasing. My life is prayer. I talk with God like I talk with a person standing next to me. And so uh, I never, it's like a phone call you never hang up on, right? You just always stay in contact. Now, in between that, there are parenthetical prayers in the daily life of my prayer where I'll pray for somebody or pray for something where those are prayers inside of my life. But I try to make it so that my conversation is always even if I'm talking to another person, I'm aware of the fact that God is listening. And so I try to make sure that I talk to them the way I would talk to God or talk to them in God's presence because I am. Amen? Do you understand that? Now, I did make some people mad one time <clears throat> in a meeting because I didn't pray at the beginning. And when we broke for lunch, they left and they told the host that I could not be of God because I didn't open with prayer and close with prayer. And they said, you know, they left and we lost them. And I said, well, I'm, you know, I'm sorry, but it's probably a good thing because if that made them mad, if they'd have stayed, I'd have really made them mad later. <laughs> <clears throat> so if you're that easily offended, I can tell you now, you might as well go ahead and leave, <laughs> all right? Because <clears throat> this whole thing, uh, God didn't choose me because of my tact or because, <laughs> okay, <laughs> or because of my manners of dealing with people, all right? Uh, but if you, really, if you go back, and I'm not using this as an excuse or anything, but if you go back, most of the people that were greatly used of God did, weren't always the most congenial people. 
right? They were more interested in spending time with God than they were with people. And many times they looked at people as an interruption <laughs> with their relationship with God, okay? You talk, that's the way it was with Wigglesworth. Lake was a little different. And really, Lake is where I learned to pray uh, through Dr. Lake and what he taught uh, concerning prayer was that he said that people always said that he should pray and then run. And he said, but his life and ministry had not been conducive to that lifestyle, so God showed him how to pray as he run, as he ran, get it right. Uh, and, and really, to be honest with you, that's the way I have to live. If, see, all the things about, well, we get a, I have to pray an hour before every meeting. Uh, you know, to get the anointing or whatever. <clears throat> okay, if that were true, I couldn't spend time with you. And so, now, are there times when I spend time in prayer? Yes. Are there times when I go off by myself? Yes, I, I love to walk and pray. I would rather, and it's kind of strange because I don't care really where I walk. <clears throat> it really doesn't matter to me. I, I walk in the mountains. I love going off in the mountains. We live in Denver now, so I get to go off to the mountains from time to time. Um, you know, I can go to a mall and just walk around and pray. I like to walk. And so a lot of times I'll just go outside the meetings and just walk around. So that's what I like to do. <clears throat> so I do spend time in prayer, but it's not a, I don't, and I don't mean this in any mean way or anything, but I do not use, and if I thought I did, I would stop it totally and completely, but I do not use prayer or worship as a manipulation to get God to do something. You understand? I use prayer and worship for what they're meant to be. Prayer is communion with God. That's it. Communion with God. Spending time fellowshipping with God. God does not have to see me coming and think, what does he want now? You understand? I don't just go to God to get something. I fellowship with God, and I find that I get more of God's nature and character and spirit by fellowshipping with him than by getting things by asking for stuff. Okay? I've already been blessed with every spiritual blessing. I really don't need to ask for anything. I live in the fullness of that. I believe that, and what I need is there when I need it. Okay? Now, worship, same thing. I refuse to use worship as a coercion or a manipulation to get God to show up or do something. <clears throat> worship especially in, in healing. Now, I know that there's a lot of things along these lines. I know there are people who, when they play a musical instrument, people get healed. Okay, that's called a gift, right? I'm not against that. If that's your gift, do it, okay? But it's technically not the Bible way of ministering healing, okay? Again, I'm not, I'm not against it. But what you'll find is usually it's Christians that get healed that way, not people on the street. Mark 16, and, and basically what we're doing for the DHT and what we're teaching here is for the street and it's for people that are not Christian. All right? <clears throat> for the first 300 years of the church, there was no such thing as a healing service in the church. What, what we're doing here, where we have lines of healing, technically that's not scriptural. Now, God lets us do it. You know, just like Sunday school isn't scriptural, but God uses it and lets us do it to, to train people and, and that kind of thing. You understand it's not that... Just because something isn't scriptural doesn't mean you can't do it. And what I mean is, just because it's not in the Bible. Now, if it's anti-scriptural, yeah, you can't do it. Okay? But as far as, uh, it's kind of funny because we have made worship. Now we have the six-fold ministry instead of the five-fold ministry. You, you understand? Worship leader is not in the Bible as a ministry in Ephesians but we've made it where if you don't have one, you can't have church. Now, I'm not against worship, okay? But we have made it into something that it was never meant to be. And now we've made it to where you can't do the things the Bible says to do if you don't have something that the Bible never said to have. You understand? And so, <clears throat> a lot of the things that I have found out, I found out I would consider by accident, if you want to call it that, I'm sure God saw it coming, but I didn't. And so I called it an accident. <clears throat> and one of the things that I learned, especially about healing, is that we have so many things that we think you have to have to have healing. And I found that none of them are true. Jesus did not have a worship band walking with him through Galilee. 
to set the atmosphere so he could work miracles. Right? He was the atmosphere. So what I, I'm, I'm supposed to be being conformed to the image of Christ. So my life should be looking more like his, not less like his. And if I can't find it in his life, I really don't want it in my life. And so, now, that's not to say I don't worship. If you, if you went to my motel room right now, I've got a thing of a CD thing that I carry with me. And probably, probably a good 80% of it is worship CDs. Right? So I do listen to it. I do worship uh, in that sense. But worship isn't just by listening to music. You can do it without music. Your life is supposed to be a worship. What you do every day not what you do for an hour before meeting or only on Sundays. As a matter of fact, if that's the only time you worship, you're not worshiping. All right? So <clears throat> worship isn't an event. It's life. And so uh, as far as do you need worship you know, for a healing meeting? No. Why? Because Jesus didn't have it. And he had some pretty good healing meetings. <laughs> All right? Now, can you have it? Sure. Uh, you know, can it get in the way? It can. You know, can it, can it do some good? Yeah, it can do that too. But you have to remember, on the street, you're not going to have it. If you go into a store, you're not going to be able to take them your CD and say, would you put this on so I can, I'm going to be ministering healing over on aisle three. Okay, it's not going to work that way. Okay? So, see, what I've tried to do, and, and a lot of this, like I said, by accident, it seems to be by accident, that I've stumbled onto some of these things. It's, it's funny, Winston Churchill one time said that men often stumble over truth, but they quickly pick themselves up and move on as though nothing happened. <laughs> so, that's, unfortunately, that's true sometimes. Well, when I was in martial arts, I was emphasized, well, the reason I got into martial arts when I was roughly nine years old, I got in a fight with a Golden Gloves boxer and I got my nose busted. And I said, that'll never happen to me again. And it didn't. And so, because uh, I went into martial arts and trained, and I was in, interested more in empty hand fighting, but as it progressed, I got into some weapons training, and then because of various reasons, I had to study weapons in, in particular. And my weapons of choice, I mean, I had I pretty well excelled at all weapons at some point, including firearms. And uh, when I went in the military, I was marksman, and was actually going to go through sniper school before God started dealing with me about getting out and ministering the gospel. And so <clears throat> when I was in martial arts, so I, my weapons, my specialty weapons was the knife and the stick. And so I always use either single stick, double stick, um, single knife, double knife, you know, that kind of thing. Either short knife, long knife, didn't matter, swords, all that stuff. If it was bladed, I enjoyed it. <laughs> okay. And so even to this day, it's funny because after I got here, Actually, when I started getting into, you know, if you, I always carry a pocket knife. I always got a knife on me, always. And, and it, it's a tool now. It's not a weapon, but it's a tool. And anytime you saw me, you would see me with a knife. But then when I got on the plane, you know, I always have to put my knives in, the, in my check-in, not in my carry-on. And so as, when I was leaving, I had my luggage. And as I was going out, one of the wheels broke off my luggage. So I had to go back in and transfer everything from one suitcase to another. And in the zipper in the back was where I usually put my knife, and I forgot to transfer it, so it got left at home. I got to the airport and remembered. I thought, ah. asked my wife to check. Sure enough, it was there. And I thought, ah. I mean, honestly, this will be the longest I've gone without a knife in my pocket in 30 years. <laughs> okay? And so, and it's funny, then when I got over here, I found out that knives are basically illegal here, especially to carry in your pocket. And so I didn't know that. I saw it on a sign. So, okay, God's watching out for me and kept me from getting arrested while I'm here. Because so. <laughs> if I'd have had it, I'd been carrying it. Well, but the thing was, is I started studying, uh, I studied knife fighting, stick fighting, and then I started teaching stick and knife fighting. But what I started noticing was in myself was that I started practicing stick and knife fighting more than empty hand. And then I realized that a weapon is supposed to be just an extension of the human body, and at least that's what it's supposed to be in your mind. And, but I started realizing I started training more with, with a knife than I did empty hand. And then I thought, what if I was ever caught without my weapon, without a knife? Or what if I get disarmed? So then I put away my knives and my stick and just started doing empty hand because I wanted to strip away anything 
that could be taken away from me so that I could never be caught unarmed. So whenever God brought me into the ministry and started using me and teaching me about healing and things, I started noticing Christians do the same thing. We've got our bottle of oil. We've got our prayer cloths. We've got all kinds of things. We've got music. We've got worship. We've got prayer. We've got everything that are actually extras that we think we have to have to be able to minister to the sick. And so I immediately said, I went back and saw the Bible, and Jesus didn't have any of that. So I started stripping away all of that so that no matter what, when you get down to it, at some point you could have everything taken away from you. And if the only way you can minister healing is by anointing with oil, if they take away your oil, then you're useless in the kingdom of God when it comes to healing. So I decided not to rely on oil. So I got rid of the oil. Then I saw prayer clause. I got rid of the prayer clause. Now, I, I will give you testimonies of prayer clause that are amazing, all right? We have seen some of the greatest miracles through prayer clause. Now, but it's the same way with everything else. It's the same thing with worship. We, we have things that are benefits to us and can help, but unfortunately, we turn them into crutches that we have to have. Well, so I just started stripping away everything that was not absolutely necessary, and that's why... Because see, if you go into a place, if the enemy knows you have to have oil, he'll make sure somebody forgot to bring it. If he knows that the only way you can minister is by getting into the spirit through worship, then guess what? He'll either make the worship team late or the power will go out. Well, we've had that happen many times. And so the enemy will try to do anything he can. Anything you rely on, he'll try to take it away from you. So just beat him to the punch. Right? Just strip away everything, and then he can take nothing from you. And then once you can operate functionally and effectively with nothing, then it doesn't matter what he does because he can't stop you. Amen? So you won't, you won't find anything in, especially in the New Testament, about worship and healing and worship being essential for healing. Now, you see a lot of things about worshiping after you're healed. Right? But not before. See, at the very best, that was Old Testament, and even that wasn't a normal method of healing. Right? So there's just things you're going to see as we go on here. This is extremely simple, extremely functional, stripped down to where basically all I do is I take away all your excuses. Right? So you got nothing left to do but be obedient. Amen? So, you know, if I don't pray before, okay, first off, there is nothing in the Bible about praying before a meeting. Nothing, right? Now, there's nothing about praying for the sick when it comes to Mark 16. So you have to realize there's praying in church and then there's praying for the unbelievers. Well, there's only two times it's even mentioned about it, you know, about ministering like that. Mark 16 says believers will lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. It doesn't say pray. That's something you threw in there. See, that's an extra thing. And then that's when we say, do we have to get permission from somebody to pray for them before they get healed? No, you don't have to pray. All you got to do is touch them. You know? I mean, you know how easy it is to touch somebody? Ah, my name is. What are they going to do? Same thing. Guess what you're doing? Laying hands. He said, well, that's not laying hands. Laying hands has to be like this. Really? Go back and study every time it talks about somebody laying hands and it tells what they did. Every time it says they took him by the right hand. Every time. Whenever Peter and James, we read it last night, whenever P, or Peter and John, when they went to the temple, it says that Peter reached down, took him by the right hand, and lifted him up. Right? You read over and over again, it says that they took him by the hand, or Jesus touched their hand. It's amazing. See, we have all this stuff built up, and it's not even in the Bible. And then we wonder why it doesn't work. You yeah? know? It's like telling somebody, well, you know, I, I'm, I'm filling my gas tank. My car still won't start. What are you filling it with? Water. <laughs> you see? And then you want to grab at the, you know, the car manufacturer. No, it's because you're adding stuff in that it didn't say to do. And then, and then it doesn't work, and you want to know why. Well, it's real simple. Get back to the simplicity of the gospel and just do what he said to do. Now, am I against worship? No. <clears throat> but when we were at church when we had our church in Dallas, we, at first I had worship going, 
and people would show up, you know, usually worship would last 30, 40 minutes, and people would show up sometime, you know, I think we started, we started our services in the evening at 3, and that gave other people time to come from other churches over as they could come, come and visit. And so we'd start at 3 with the worship, sing to about 3.30, 3.45, and people would be coming in from 3 to 3.45, so finally, I got tired of it because they were just using worship as the you know previews, like at a movie theater. You know, well, we're not missing anything; they're just showing the previews, so it's okay. So I, one day I got up and I said, "From now on, I will start preaching at three o'clock. If you're not here, you're going to miss part of the message. Simple as that." And the next Sunday, I started preaching at three o'clock, and guess what? Some people showed up late, and they got mad. And I told them, "You should be here on time." <laughs> right? And then when we finished. Because they, well, they told me, they said, well, we thought you'd be doing worship. I said, no, I told you I'm going to start preaching. Didn't tell you I was going to do worship. We're going to do worship afterwards, after I tell you what the Word of God says that God did for you, and then you'll have something to be thankful about. And so we started doing our worship at the end. It was amazing. Then, and then we started praying for the sick and had worship while I was praying for the sick. And, you know, it took care of two things at the same time. And then that way we could worship. We could have stayed there and worshiped five hours. It wouldn't have mattered. People could leave when they want to. Right? And so we just stuck to it. So... <clears throat> we, um, as far as I'm concerned, worship has nothing to do with you getting healing, right? The, the whole idea about corporate worship and all that kind of stuff, the reason that works is because you believe it works, right? There's nothing necessarily in the Bible about that, especially in the New Testament about it being necessary. And so I, I just don't do it because you don't have it on the street, right? And this is about the street. <clears throat> in Mark, it talks about laying hands on the sick, and then in James, it says that, the, you call for the elders of the church and they will come and anoint you with oil. That was it. And they, will, they, the elders, will pray the prayer of faith. Not the sick person. The elders pray the prayer of faith. Right? So the faith of the elders should get you well. Right? And so that's the only time it really talks about prayer. And that's for believers, not for unbelievers. Unbelievers don't need prayer for healing. They just need to be touched. Okay? So, again you will find out that I believe the Bible literally exactly the way it's written. Uh, don't add anything in or take anything out. Uh, Toronto Blessing and all the laughter the, the, through uh, Rodney Howard Brown ministry. Are they of God? If so, what scripture backing have they, do they have? Okay. Um, first off, Rodney Howard Brown is not my servant. He's God's. I got nothing to say about him. Right? That's between him and God. Right? Simple as that. Um, if he was my servant, I might say something, but he's not, right? Now, as far as it of God, people get helped, apparently, right? Now, personally, myself, I wouldn't go to one of his meetings, right? I mean, I'm just being honest with you. Um, the other thing is, because this kind of ties in with the word. Now, I understand I'm not against him, right? I'm not saying that. I just, my time to me is extremely valuable, and I can laugh at home. All right? I mean, on, honestly, I have never had as good a time with God in a church as I have in my own home. So I don't need to go to church to get touched. Right? As many would say, <laughs> I'm already touched. Okay? <laughs> so, and so, uh, so you understand, I'm not putting him down. It's different ministries. All right? And there is, there's good that comes out of that. And there's people that need it and things it's it, the problem I think comes in whenever you go too far in one direction and stay there right which again if that's the way God leads him wonderful uh, but God doesn't lead me to go to those meetings okay and so I, I don't um, I, some of some of the people that I know that I'm good friends with their life was turned around in his meetings turned around totally turned around and they're on fire for God today because they were in his meetings all right so I got no problem with what to do but for me, I'm not reached that way. I'm not ministered to that way, right? If you are wonderful, you know, just, it's neither here nor there, you know? <clears throat> some say I'm of Apollos and some of Cephas, and, you know, so it's just, it, it's, you decide sometimes. Now, uh, in the area of worship, it's the, same, it's the same thing. We use that sometimes to a degree, and it, and it gets in the way sometimes more than it helps. And so, <clears throat> those are along the same lines, that if it's there, wonderful. If it's not there, it doesn't matter. Um, you know, one of the reasons why we don't do worship in these meetings is because we have stripped this down to the bare essential. You get constant information the full three days. 
So, you know, if we were going to do worship meetings, we would have to start an hour earlier or go an hour later because the material has to be covered, right? And, and, I, and I'm not putting, when I say this, don't think I'm putting worship down. I'm not. But what I mean is, honestly, I'm only here for a short period of time. And you can worship on your own time. Is, do you understand what I'm saying? I hope you understand my heart. You, can, you have plenty of time to worship after I'm gone, okay? And so but we have to use the time wisely to get as much information to you as possible, something that you can carry home with you and, and help you, right? So I hope you understand that's why we do that, right? Not against worship um, like that, okay. Da, 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 da. When we are healing the sick and praying for people, how important are the prayer backup or the intercessors? Again, here's the problem. We have... Um, what I'm doing, what I've learned, and what is working, I didn't get in church, right? I didn't get it sitting in church. I didn't get it by going to church every Sunday. I didn't get it that way. I went after it. I had, my daughter died. Now, she was gone. There was no helping her. But I knew that her dying was not God's will. I knew God didn't do it, and I knew it wasn't right, and I knew how much it hurt my wife and myself and so I knew that I didn't want somebody else to ever hurt like that. And so I went after it. I didn't stop studying healing when she died. I dove in even more so. And so we went after it. Now, <clears throat> I've always said that if you're going to walk with God, at some point you're going to have to walk alone. Because generally that's what ends up happening. Church is usually designed for the lowest common denominator. That's why people don't learn much at church. Right? Because as soon as an unsaved person walks in, we automatically gear the service toward winning the lost instead of edifying and building up the body of Christ. Now, I'm not saying that's you know, right or wrong. I'm just saying, in my way of thinking, there should be two meetings. There should be a, a believer's meeting and there should be an evangelistic meeting, one where you can focus toward reaching the lost. Now, the evangelistic meeting should be a healing demonstration meeting where the power of God is in full manifestation to show the unbelievers that there is a God to follow. Amen? We, we don't save the signs and wonders for the believers meeting. Believers don't need signs and wonders. They should be the ones performing the signs and wonders by the Spirit of God. And so, <clears throat> but too often we gear it toward the lower, lowest common denominator and there's no real growth taking place in the body of Christ. Now, because that was the way it was where I was at, I didn't learn anything about healing in church that worked to any degree. And so I spent a lot of time alone. At one point, I decided, actually what it was is I read an E.W. Kenyon book, and he, the, the whole book was good, but he made one statement that kept saying, don't be a spiritual hitchhiker. And I never could get rid of that. That stuck with me, and I decided right then, anything that God has promised me, I will get for myself. Now, I understand that wasn't being proud or that kind of stuff. I mean, there were times when I was going through things and battling some things that they called a healing line and I didn't go. Why? Because I was determined to get it on my own faith. Because if I couldn't get it for myself, what made me think I could get it for somebody else? That was my mentality. That was before I understood sowing and reaping and, and, and really going and praying for the sick while you're sick to get healed. I didn't, I didn't get it at that point. And so, but I would fight through this thing through faith until I could get it for myself, because once I got it, then I knew I could get it for somebody else. And I refused to be a spiritual hitchhiker and let somebody else do all my battles for me. Right? My, I'm telling you, my pastor could, if you ever went to him, especially the pastor I started with, and asked him how many times I came for prayer or counsel or anything else like that, he, he would tell you, I can't remember Curry ever coming for prayer or for counsel. Why? Because I would just dig in, find out what the Word of God said, and then stick to that. I did some crazy things. I mean, things I wouldn't want you to do, right? And, and it prolonged, in some cases, pain I was going through, different things. But the end result was I got it. And because of that, I can stand here and tell you, you're not going to go through anything that you can't beat. Why? If you have the Spirit of God, because it's the Spirit of God in you that beats it. Now, all the Spirit of God needs is somebody that will stand strong long enough for the answer to get to you. Most people quit before the answer ever gets there. Most people have a pain tolerance that they'll quit before they... I, I've gone through situations where, literally, if relief hadn't come, I would have passed out. 
Okay? Now, just by, is there anybody here that is parked across the street? Right across the street? Okay, there is a policeman out there. Looks like he's writing tickets. <laughs> so, might want to check that out. They're good? Okay. Okay. Okay, I just saw him out there and I thought, okay. <laughs> just wanted to let somebody know. <laughs> so, see, I could have done that right and I could have said, I, I see a policeman. <laughs> somebody. And when you would have went to your car, there'd have been a ticket there, and you'd have thought, oh, Curry knew. It was just <laughs> <laughs> but <clears throat> now, the reason I'm, I'm answering some of these questions is because I want you to know, I want to get these questions out of the way, kind of, because y'all got good questions. They're, they're serious questions, and you're not just trying to pick a fight. You know, some people write questions that are not a real question. They, they, they're just trying to emphasize their point of view or something like that. So if I read that, I won't, I won't answer it. But if you're seriously trying to get answers, I will answer you and I'll spend time working with you till you get it. Because the main thing is to get that out of your way and then you can move forward, right? Sometimes no matter what you teach, until you get the, the questions out of the way, people can't hear what you're saying. And that's why I answer so many questions. And, and that's, actually I got this from Dr. Sumrall. Sumrall, we just take questions. First time you ever read them, you'd hold them up, read it out and answer it by the Spirit of God. And I said, well, if he can do that, I got the same Spirit, I can do that. And so, just because I answer your question doesn't mean I knew the answer before I read it. Sometimes, that way, as I read it, I don't know what the answer is. So I open my mouth, the answer comes out. I go, yeah, okay, that's Bible. Right? And so, <clears throat> I do it for myself as much as for you because I, that's me relying on the Holy Spirit. People think I don't believe in relying on the Holy Spirit. I, I believe in it more than you do. People, people don't believe that we believe in being led by the Spirit. I believe in it more than you do. See, you believe that you're led by the Spirit at times. I believe he always leads me, right? As many, as, Romans eight fourteen, which is a scripture many people take out of, script, you know, out of context. It says, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. And people think that that means at times when God comes on you. But the original Greek of that scripture says, as many as are constantly, consistently led by the Spirit, they are the sons of God, right? But to be very honest, well, let's look at that twofold. Number one, that's not a periodical leading. That's a constant leading. That's always being led, right? That's what I believe. So I believe in being led more than you do sometimes if you believe that God has to come on you and lead you. See? Now, the thing is, though, that scripture isn't even talking about being led to go do something. That scripture, all of Romans 8, is talking about being led to crucify the deeds of the flesh, to mortify the deeds of the flesh. It has nothing to do with laying hands on the sick. You don't have to be led to lay hands on the sick. You're commanded to do it. <clears throat> you don't need to be led for what you're commanded. A command means you do it, right? The, the, the command has within itself its own leading. If it doesn't, it's not a command. It's a suggestion. But when he says, you will do this, then that's what we do. So, <clears throat> I, I don't... Uh, that whole chapter is about killing the deeds of the flesh. That's how you know you're a son of God. You kill the deeds of the flesh because the, the flesh doesn't lead you to kill the deeds of the flesh. So when you're being led to kill the deeds of the flesh, you know it's by the Spirit and that's how you know you're a son. Right? That's what it's about. That's what Romans 8's about and you need to read that whole thing. Now, matter of fact, talk about Romans 8. <coughs> it says, Scripture, Romans 8, 28, all things work together for the good for those who are called, love the Lord and are called according to His purpose. Right? Most people only go half of that. They say, well, all things work together for the good. But that's not what that Scripture says. All things do not work together for the good of every person. Do you understand that? Well, you know, if they got sickness, because that's what this is talking about, does God allow uh, us, or does this scripture allow us to believe that God can or, you, or will use sickness for his greater glory? All right, there's a difference between can or will or does or all that kind of stuff. Now, <clears throat> the will of God is very clear. God wants you well, he wants you healthy, and he wants you a good example so that you can go get others well and healthy. Right? Every employer wants healthy workers. Okay, God is not stupid. He knows that a healthy worker can work harder than a sick worker. Amen? Okay, a healthy worker can go further, and we're commanded to go into all the world. People who are handcuffed to medicine or drugs can't do that unless you stock up ahead of time and take it with you. You understand? So, so sickness and disease, having to rely on medicine, cannot be God's will because it would stop you from fulfilling the Great Commission. So now <clears throat> what that scripture says is 
all things work together for the good to those who love God and are the called, the called according to his purpose. That means that if you don't love God, all things don't work together for your good. You understand that? And then people say, well, you know, this guy's a bad guy and God gave him cancer. To, so, because, you know, I heard a story one time where, God's, where this guy said, well, you know, I was sick and dying and I was on my back. And after God got me on my back with cancer, that's when I came to the Lord. Okay, first off, you're assuming that God put you there so that you would come to him. And that, that's how that happened, okay? The reality of that is you were stupid, <laughs> right? Because you, you didn't love God. You weren't following God. That's stupid, right? And because of that, in the middle of that, you got sick. And you got cancer. Or you got whatever it is you got. Now, in, in the middle of you being sick, you got smart. And you turned to God. All right? You got that? All right, it, okay, it's a beep. Don't worry about it. <laughs> it's amazing. You can have a meeting going on and, I mean, be putting out truths of the Word of God and, and you know, a fly will come in. <clears throat> and people will look at that fly like they've never seen a fly in their life. I mean, you are revealing the secrets of the mysteries of the universe. <laughs> and the people will be sitting there watching that fly. It's amazing. And then they want to tell somebody else. You see the fly? You see that? They want to tell. Okay. <laughs> We've had, we had one time I was in a meeting in, the, in a motel meeting room and a storm come in and all the power went out. Pitch black. And everybody started getting scared. Oh, you know, everybody wants to get up and run out. And it's like, okay, it, it, you don't want to run out. <laughs> right? And I told everybody, just, everybody just stay put. Lights come back on in a minute. And the only light in the room was an, an exit sign. That was it. And you really couldn't see anything by that. But I, I moved over there. I took my Bible. I opened it up. And I held it up. And I kept reading. And kept preaching until the lights came back on. Well, why would I let a light going out stop me from preaching? You can preach in the dark, right? And if I couldn't have read by the Bible, I have preached without my Bible for 12 hours straight. Quoting scripture, you know, just... Preaching the gospel. So, because it can't be here. If whenever trouble comes, you have to say, well, let's see, what does the Bible say about that? You're already beat. Whenever trouble comes, it's got to be here. Right? And it's got to come out of your mouth, and it's got to flow out. And it should be that you're so full of this, when you open your mouth, word, the word of God just pours out of you. You shouldn't have to go, well, let's see what it says. Okay, it says here. No. It should be a part of you. If I can get you to do anything while I'm here, the best, the greatest thing I could get you to do is fall in love with this book. Because if you'll fall in love with this book, it will take care of you. Amen? Now, I'm not talking about <clears throat> the letter, you know, and being a Pharisee. I'm talking about understanding the, the gist of the book, understanding what God meant through his book. But get that word in you so that it comes out of you. You ought to be able to, See, again, if somebody took my Bible, they couldn't shut me up. Do you understand? Because there are places where Bibles are illegal. And I can still go there and preach the gospel. Amen? You, yeah, this stuff's got to be real to you. And so, <clears throat> and one of the reasons I do know as much scripture as I do, my first pastor <clears throat> was an unusual person. He was actually the pilot and security for, he was actually also a former Houston police officer. But he was the pilot and security for the happy hunters. And so he had a you know, understanding of healing also at that point. And we were in this little bitty church that the whole building would probably fit in this middle section here. And we would come in on Sunday and sometimes out of, I mean, out of nowhere, he wouldn't tell us, but he would just hit the lights. Boom, all the lights go out. He had a flashlight. Boom, he'd hit you with a flashlight. He'd say, give me a scripture. And you'd have to quote the scripture. And you'd have to quote something. And so immediately, you know, you were hoping you were one of the first three or four people. <laughs> you know? Because if it was beyond that, you know, John 3.16 was already gone. <laughs> you know, Jesus wept was already taken. <laughs> you know, so you were hoping he just hit me, hit me. But he started talking about how he had gone into different places and they didn't have Bibles and he talked about a time when it was possible that even in America that Bibles could be illegal. And I thought, well, I'm, I'll outsmart them. 
So I went home and started writing the Bible in a notebook. And I, and I completely wrote the New Testament in a notebook. And then I put the notebook on my shelf. And I thought, if they get my Bible, they won't get my notebook. See? I didn't know that when I was writing it, it was also getting into me. And so by the time I finished it, I could actually quote major parts of it. And so I would, I, when we homeschooled our kids, we homeschooled them because we traveled a lot. When we homeschooled them, one of the first things that I basically taught them history because I like history and especially church history. But one of the things we made them do was write the New Testament. They wrote the entire New Testament by hand. At first we had them typing it because my wife was teaching them typing too. And then we realized my son found out how to copy and paste. <laughs> so <laughs> we, we figured out, better go to handwriting. <laughs> so just a good, good idea if you can do it. Anyway, um, but does God... <clears throat> So all things don't work together for the good unless you, are, unless you love God and are be called according to his purpose. Now, in that case, it doesn't mean everything happens as God's will. It's just saying that God can take what the devil meant for evil and turn it for good, right? But it doesn't mean that God did it. And it sure doesn't mean he did it to you so that you would turn to, to him. Because remember, whatever is right for one has to be right for all. And if God would go to that extreme for some people, then he would have to go to that extreme for every person. Right, And if there was ever a person that didn't contract cancer and then turn to God and, yet, and they didn't do that and they never got cancer and then they died and went to hell, then it would be God's fault because he didn't use every means to turn them around. Do you understand? So this is one of the things I learned from Dr. Sumrall. If it's right for one, what, what is right for one has to be right for everyone. That's why homosexuality, that's why it can't be right. See, because it can't be right. For, if it's right for one, it has to be right for all. Homosexuality can't be right for all because if everyone was homosexual, the entire human race would die out in one generation. And you couldn't complete God's fulfill or His commandment to multiply and replenish the earth. You see? So it can't be right. Now, there's other scriptures too that go along with that, but I'm just saying, just the basic principle is there. Okay? So you just have to realize whatever God does for one, He will do for another. And so you can't go back in and say, well, you know, I was, I, you know, God gave me this cancer to turn me around. No, that's not true. God gave Jesus cancer so you don't have to bear it. You understand? He bore the stripes in your sickness and disease so you don't have to. Now, we'll, we'll look at this in just a minute, as a matter of fact. Now, uh, does God allow sickness to teach us things like patience? No. Well, yes and no. Right? What I mean is, he doesn't allow it to teach you things like patience. Now, does he allow it? Yeah, he allows whatever you allow. Why? Because he put this thing in your hands. He told you, you do these things. You take care of these things. You are your brother's keeper. If your brother's sick, it's not God's fault. It's your fault. Right? That got quiet. <laughs> he told you to heal the sick. He told you to cast out devils. He didn't say pray to him to cast them out. Oh, God, cast the devil out of this person. Nope, won't, won't happen. Why? He, did, he didn't say. See, T.L. Osborne said there's two things you should never pray or never ask God to do. You should never ask God to do what he's told you to do. And you should never ask God to do what he's already done. Right? It's pretty simple. So he put that in your hands. So God will allow whatever you allow. Why? Because he basically set you over the works of his hands and for you to do his work for him on this earth by the power of his spirit. So whatever's going on, it's up to you to take care of it, not him. Oh, why did God allow this to happen? Why did you allow it to happen? You understand? It's real simple. See, the thing is, here's the problem. <clears throat> you think you're still human. And because of that, you think humans fail and humans have faults and humans do all these things and humans are humans and can only do these things. But you're not normal. You were never meant to be normal. Paul wrote and made it very clear. He said, why do you still act as mere mortal men? Why? You say, well, why shouldn't we? Because you're not mere mortal men. You are nowhere told that you're men or even women. Matter of fact, he says that we are now sons of God. And he said, and you are to be as sons of God holding forth the word of life blameless, as a matter of fact, right? Well, a son of God is not a mere human. See, that's the thing. You're, you're not, I understand, 
<clears throat> people have different terminologies and they say things like, well, you know, we're just sinners saved by grace. No, you were a sinner. You were saved by grace, but you're not a sinner now. Now you are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. You understand? Well, but I still sin. Okay, well, if you sin, if, not when, but if you sin, then you have an advocate with the Father. You go to the advocate, Jesus Christ, you confess those sins, and you're cleansed of all unrighteousness. Isn't that simple? But now, that doesn't make you a sinner because being a sinner is being a sinner by nature. You are no longer by nature a child of the devil. You are now by nature a child of God. It should be easier for you to commit righteousness than it is for you to sin. Remember how easy it was to you, for you to sin before you got saved? It should be that easy for you to live in righteousness now. Christianity was never meant to be hard. The reason Christianity is hard for people, number one, most people, many people, never even get born again. <clears throat> the church is mainly full of not converted sinners, but convicted sinners. You're convicted, but you never get converted. Converted means to turn around and to turn away from. Many people never turn away from it. They just know they shouldn't be doing it. And then they feel bad, and then they come to church to try to get out from under guilt, which coming to church is usually the worst place to try to get away from guilt. <clears throat> okay? That's usually what you can get, is get heavy doses of guilt. Now, but the key is to get truly born again, see the difference, the essence, and we're going to be talking about this. This is, this is kind of the crux of the matter of, of why things work. The essence of Christianity is this. There were two covenants. There was an old covenant. There's a new covenant. If we call it a new covenant, that means there had to be an old covenant. Now, if there's a new covenant, it means that the old covenant didn't do what needed to be done, so there had to be a new covenant that could do what needed to be done. Now, if the new covenant couldn't do what needed to be done, there would need to be a newer covenant to come in. But since the new covenant was based on the blood of Jesus and not the blood of bulls and goats like the old covenant, the new covenant is an eternal covenant that will never need revision. You understand? The old covenant could not give life. It could not give righteousness. All it could do is point out your faults and was characterized by don't do this, don't do that, thou shalt not, thou shalt not. The new covenant is not the, the covenant of thou shalt not. The new covenant is the covenant of thou shalt. You understand? The thou shalt is thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and mind, soul, and strength. And thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. You understand? Not thou shalt not. See, if you're trying to live by rules, you're still trying to live by the old covenant. And, and as long as you're trying to live by the old covenant, you're not in the new covenant. And if you're not in the new covenant, you're not born again. Now, the essence of the new covenant is this. The old covenant could not purge your conscience of sins. The new covenant... The characterization of the new covenant is that your conscience is purged of sin. Now, if that is the basis of being in the new covenant, then you can tell most people are not in the new covenant. Because most people cannot forget who they used to be. Isn't that right? Most people have a past, and most people talk about it all the time. And usually their past determines how they walk with God. Because they always think, uh, you know... <clears throat> But for the grace of God, there go I. Well, that is true. But you have to remember, and, and this goes right into the generational curse thing. It goes right into spiritual roots and family spiritual roots and all that kind of stuff. This is real simple. I have no generational past. My generation goes back to one generation, Jesus Christ. Why? <clears throat> you understand that? I don't go back to see what my granddaddy did. I could care less what he did. I don't care what his sins were. It makes no difference. Why? Because I'm not of that lineage anymore. I'm of one lineage. I'm a new creation, a new creature, a new species that never existed before. What does that mean? That means that I can't go back to the Old Testament and find out how to live. Why? Because they weren't new creations. So I can't look at them. Now, I can look at their faith, and I can imitate their faith. But I can't look at them as examples of necessarily how to live other than faith. You understand that? A lot of them made a lot of big mistakes. I mean, every, well, a lot of them. All of them. All of them made mistakes. 
Moses killed a guy. Right? I mean, Abraham lied about his wife. Said, no, that's my sister. Right? All kinds of mistakes. Noah got drunk. Everybody made mistakes. Okay? So I don't use them as examples of how to live. Jesus is my only example. He is it. He is the only example I have. Why? Because he's the only person with the Spirit of God. See, if I have the Spirit of God, then I have to look back and find a person with the Spirit of God that I can imitate. That's Jesus. So he is my example. <clears throat> he is my generation. It goes back to him. My life is hid in him. If my life is hidden in him, why would I want to talk about it? See, the New Testament, the epistles just tell me who I am in Christ. They tell me who I am in him and who he is in me, and they tell me what he's done for me, what he's doing in me, and what he's doing through me. So obviously I already spend most of my time in the epistles. Right? But it's amazing because we always go back to the Old Testament. Now, we look at these things and we start to realize it because uh, even here, <clears throat> why are there so many believers who are waiting for their healing even though they had faith and the person praying for them also had faith? Okay, you're assuming that. Okay? First off, they're waiting for their healing because generally they haven't met somebody with enough power to take care of it. Right? Now, they should have the power themselves, but if they don't, see, there's two ways to get healing. Get it for yourself or get to somebody that can get it for you. That's it. Now, <clears throat> it says here, the person had faith praying, and they had faith, and the other person that was praying for them had faith. Okay? You're saying that, but if they didn't get healed, then the answer is no. Do you understand? Why? Because he says, you pray the prayer of faith, and they will be healed. So the Bible says if you pray the prayer of faith, they're going to get well. You're saying these people prayed in faith and they didn't get well. Okay, well, I can't go with what you say. I've got to go with what the Bible says. So I have to assume. That's like people say, well, you know, a Christian can't have a devil. Okay, what's your problem? Well, I'm alcoholic. Well, I'm, what, you know, go through the list. And I say, oh, well, you got a devil. Well, that can't be true because I'm a Christian. I can't have a devil. Okay, well, what you have is a devil. So if a Christian can't have a devil, you're not a Christian. Oh, no, I know I'm a Christian. Okay, then... So you're a Christian with, with the devil. <laughs> you understand? You see how people, they, they try to say these things. Now, bottom line is, <clears throat> if it was sin, it was sin. If it was sin before you got born again, it's sin after you get born again. If it was a devil, if an unsaved person has it and they have a devil and you have the same problem they do, it's still a devil. Right? See, your problem is you think you're, you're misinterpreting spirit, soul, and body. See, a, a physical, a, a devil can inhabit your physical body and have nothing to do with your spirit, right? He can mess with your mind and not touch your spirit, right? Now, that's not God's will. God's will is that you be blameless and wholly sanctified, W-H-O-L-O-Y, wholly sanctified, spirit, soul, and body, blameless, right? That's what God wants. He wants you to be totally separated unto God spirit, soul, and body so that the wicked one cannot touch you in your spirit, soul, or body with sickness, disease, sin, poverty, any of that stuff. All of, none of that's of God. Okay? Now, so, and I know I'm taking some time going on this. I'm going to send you to break here. Uh, is the truth that is written in the word enough faith? faith. Is stand, oh, okay, yeah. Is standing on the word faith even though everything in my mind is screaming unbelief? Yeah. Yeah. See, <clears throat> We're going to talk about this as we go along, so this, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail until I send you on break here. But you have to realize, the carnal mind is enmity at war against God. The carnal mind is death. To be carnally minded is death. To be spiritually minded is life and peace. Okay, now, did you hear that? John 10.10, 10, the thief comes to steal, kill, destroy. That side, Okay. Other side of that, Jesus came to give us life and that in abundance, right? So life and life in abundance, Jesus. Killing, stealing, destroying, devil, right? Okay. To be carnally minded is death, not life, death, right? But to be spiritually minded is life. So the carnal mind is on what side of the page? The death side. Right? Now, you can be born again in spirit, but your mind still be carnal. 
Why? Because 1 Corinthians, Paul called the Corinthians carnal Corinthians, but he said brethren, so they were born again, but they were carnal. That means their spirit was born again, but their mind was not renewed. Their mind was still carnal. That's why he had to tell them about them being sick and all the things going on, because I will tell you this. I'm going to make a statement. You might not like it, but I can't help that. I didn't write it. Okay? But it's real simple. No spiritual-minded Christian ever died of sickness or disease. Okay? If a person dies of sickness or disease, it is because they are carnally minded. Why? Because to be carnally minded is death. To be spiritually minded is what? Life and peace. Amen? Life and peace. Not just life. Life and peace. Now, that means that... Now, people say, well... And I've had that question. Well, if you believe in divine healing, if divine healing's real, how will we ever die? Uh, well... You'll die well. <laughs> okay? <laughs> you know? It's, I mean, come on. Don't you have anything more serious to worry about than how to die? <laughs> okay? I mean, if you really want to do it, just hold your breath long enough. That'll take care of it. I mean, come on. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, think about it. <clears throat> okay, now, divine healing is not immortality. Everybody Jesus healed died eventually, Right? But you don't have to die sick. You can, you can lay down, commit your soul to God, commit your spirit to God, and as we would say, give up the ghost, give up the spirit, and just go to bed. But first you ought to call on your family, bless your kids, tell everybody bye, and go to sleep. And you ought to do it when you get you know, tired, not die, not sick, not, not hooked up to a bunch of tubes and, you know, and, and, and costing your family so much money that when you die, they're going to be paying off your hospital bills for the next 20 years. Amen? Amen? I mean, come on. Just from an economic viewpoint, healing is better. Okay? <laughs> I, mean, I mean, think about that. Think about, think, what if, what if every Christian, not the world, just Christians, what if they all got well and took all the money that they spent on medicine and doctors and put it toward missions? Imagine that. Amen? I mean, imagine how much we could get done at one time. I mean, come on. That, I mean, that's massive, right? And so you can look at these things and, and realize that God wants you well, right? Now, but a spirit, now, to the degree that your mind is renewed, okay, you start out with a carnal mind, right? Well, you start out with a sin mind, okay? And then you get born again in your spirit. Now, God changes your spirit. He does that. Right? You give him permission, and he changes you. And you're a new creation. He recreates your spirit. Correct? Okay. He does that. Now, what does he tell you to do? Romans 12, 1, 2, 3. Renew your mind. He fixes your spirit. It's perfect. Why? Because he did it. And everything he does is perfect. Right? Your spirit doesn't need anything added to it. Now, but your mind, he says you renew. He doesn't say he's going to do it. You renew your mind to the word of God. Why? So that you can prove that perfect or acceptable, the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Right? See, until your mind is renewed, you can't prove God's will. So pretty much everything you say is probably going to be messed up. Even though your heart is right, your spirit's right, but in, your mind is carnal. To be carnally minded means to be flesh or sense ruled or to be ruled by what you see. As long as you're carnally minded, you don't walk by faith, you walk by sight. Well, how do I know when I'm not carnally minded? When you quit walking by sight and you start walking by faith. So the more your mind is renewed, the more your mind, okay, if you, you have 100% mind, and the more your mind is renewed, the less carnal it becomes. Now, the devil can only work in you through the carnal part of your mind. So the more spiritual your mind gets, renewed to the word of God, right? Now, now, the thing is, this word of God is what your spirit is recreated in the image of. In, in here, this is what you look like. You understand? Now, the reason you don't look like this out here is because of this. And to the degree that this is renewed, the more of this is seen out of your life. Okay? So the idea is to renew your mind to the word of God so that everything you say, do, speak, and think is this. When somebody asks your opinion, you don't give it. 
You understand? Because you don't have an opinion. You have a position. You understand? I don't have an opinion. You ask, well, is homosexual wrong? You know, what's your opinion? Don't have one. Now I can give you my position. You understand? But my position is this word. You get that? Because I don't have an opinion. I have a position. And so, now, to the degree that my mind is renewed, the, the more my mind is renewed, the less the devil can work. Because he can only work to the carnal part. Why? Because our weapons are not carnal. But his are. Our weapons are spiritual and spiritual. Do you understand? So to the degree, now see the only thing that stands between this, this being seen out of your life is this. And the more it's renewed, the more this comes out. So the key is to get your mind renewed. And when your mind is renewed, you think, talk, and agree with the word of God. And to the degree you don't think and talk and agree with the word of God, your mind is not renewed. Right? Now, if you really, the fastest way to find out how renewed you are is to find out how quick you annoy religious people. Okay? That's a fact. The faster you annoy religious people, the more your mind is renewed. Because they just get furious when all you'll do is speak Bible. It's amazing, because they want to they talk opinions. You know, well, so-and-so says this, and what do you think about that? Well, so-and-so, he says this, and you know, I kind of like what he says about it. All I care about is what this says about it. That's it. And if this doesn't say anything about it, I'm not going to say anything about it. Why? Because I don't have an opinion. You understand? The representative can only say what the one he represents has said. The minute you say something that the one you represent didn't, hadn't said or wouldn't say, you cease to be his representative. Amen?